Well, we are in the letter to the Galatians, and we're in the first third of that, and we're actually, this is the last message in the first third, and we're talking about the gospel of grace defended. Uh, Paul is defending the gospel of grace in various ways, and next week we're going to be talking about the gospel of grace explained, moving over to chapter 3. And so I'm going to go ahead and read the passage for us this morning. We're going to be reading from Galatians chapter 2, verse 16 to 21. So if you are able, uh, could you stand in honor of God and his word as we read scripture this morning? Listen to the word of God. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law... I died to the law so that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could come and be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is God's word. Please be seated. This title, Dying to Live, led me to an event that happened at a large youth festival not too long ago. And there was a young man who attended that youth festival. They had a speaker there, and he was talking about, <clears throat> he was talking about the gospel. He was talking about a relationship with God. He was talking about how to live for God. And after it was over... This young man just made a beeline for that speaker. And the speaker kind of recalls what happened. And here's kind of what it sounded like. And he asked him a penetrating question. And here's what he said. He said, so what is it that you're really, really after right now? And his response, the speaker said, it floored me what he said. And the young man said, I've heard tons of sermons and never really believed a word of any of them because they all seemed so shallow and fake. But tonight I got so angry at what you were saying. All that stuff about dying to my sin and my selfishness, it just made me angrier the more you talked. But it was the first time I've ever been convinced that a sermon was true because I was brought face to face with my own junk And all my anger. So I had to come meet you and tell you that. And I think I finally get it. I've been trying to get God to bless me and give me an easy life without giving him any of me. And that hasn't worked. As a matter of fact, it's made me suicidal. It's made me depressed. I want to try it another way. I want to give him everything and die to my past. And then he concluded with these words. I will try anything at this point because my life is a wreck and I'm dying to live, he said. I'm dying to live. Dying to live, that's an interesting statement to make. And Paul says in Galatians 2.20, a very profound and similar statement. It's a famous statement where he says, I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Dying to live, Paul's saying. Now, I thought it would be interesting, just there's a play on that word, dying to live. And and I wanted to bring that out through looking at Webster's Dictionary about that, that word die or dying, the verb. And so if we look it up, there's two There's two kind of versions of that. There's the one we all think about, dying, which is to stop living, dying. But then there's the informal definition of dying, used to emphasize that one wants to do or have something very, very much. 
I'm dying to have a drink. And in our text this morning, it's really covering both aspects of dying. Because the young man in the story was thirsting for more. He knew there was more, and he was thirsting for that. And he said, I was dying to live. And the path that we meet in the text, it requires, well, and he got it too, it requires dying to self. It, it requires dying to our ego. And in turn, living for Christ. And so, last week, we found ourselves together with Paul and Barnabas. And we were in the city of Antioch. And I want to give you a little context of where Paul is going this morning. And we were in Antioch. And Antioch, we discovered, was this most incredibly beautiful city Uh, I think it's the most underrated city in the entire New Testament. And I tried to make my case for that last week. I mean, Antioch was the only city in the world at that time where there was a colonnade, columns with porticos at intersections that went 3.5 kilometers and it was paved all with marble. It was the only city in the world that you could walk 3.5 kilometers on a marble paved colonnade road like that. Well, Paul and Barnabas, while they're up in Antioch, this most underrated city, Peter joins them. He comes from Jerusalem, and he comes up and joins them. And they are having time together with these Gentiles, these non-Jewish believers, believers, the Gentiles that came to Christ, and they're having fellowship, and they're eating meals together. And Peter, he's not concerned about eating a ham sandwich, and he's not concerned about passing more bacon, which would be you know, totally forbidden from the Jewish uh, laws. And he has no problem with that until these certain brothers come from Jerusalem, it says from James, and and they meet up with Peter. And Peter, well, he starts stepping back from those Gentile believers. He stops um, not just not asking them to pass the bacon, but he's like not eating at the same table with them at all. And Paul saw that. And Paul knew that he he had to jump into that. And so he couldn't let it go. And so Paul called him out in public, right in front of everybody. And he said, Peter, you're not walking in line with the gospel. He's he's saying you're not living the gospel convictions. You're not living in line with the truth of the gospel. You're not walking on that straight path of the gospel, which is what? Well, it's we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And he wasn't walking that. And then last week we ended in verse 16. And Paul was just making it crystal clear in verse 16 what the gospel is. And that verse 16 just kind of flows down into what we want to talk about today. Dying to live. That I'm not going to divide. um, I'm not going to divide my life like Peter did. I'm going to be committed to walking in line with the gospel. And so this morning, we're going to divide that passage, we're going to divide it into two parts. And the first part is going to be called the truth of the gospel. And I want us to think of that of, how do I become a Christian? The truth of the gospel, how do I become a Christian? And then the second part of that passage, the transformation of the gospel that it does in our lives, I want us to think about that as, how do I live the Christian life? Two excellent, excellent topics to think about this morning. So let's start with the first one, the truth of the gospel in 16 through 18. Now we find in this section, and particularly in verse 16, what has become known as the doctrine of justification by faith. And I want us to take some time to look at that. Because it's important, it's really, really important into that idea of how do I become a Christian? Now, I know when you hear words like doctrine and you hear these big words like justification by faith, you know, you can get a little intimidated. You may think, well, I don't know, maybe this is my time to take a nap or something. But don't do that, okay? I don't want you to be lulled by the topic and I don't want you to fall asleep because this is really so important. I mean, it's so important that we think about some of the great, great men of the Christian faith and Christian history, the history of the church. And they see this as the centerpiece of the gospel. I mean, Martin Luther, he said, the truth of justification by faith is the article upon which the church stands or falls. That's how important it is. 
And Calvin, he went on to say that this whole idea of what Paul's talking about here in verse 16, he said, it is the hinge upon which everything in the Christian life turns. Wow. I mean, that, that's important. So in Paul's words in response to Peter about how one becomes a Christian, what it's meant to keep in line with the gospel, listen to what he says here in verse 16. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. And I want you to listen to how many times he uses the word justify. But by faith in Jesus Christ, so we too have put our faith in Christ, in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. You just hear the word justified pops up there three times. He uses that word in one verse. And I think it's really important that we, we talk about that, that idea of justification and faith and in Christ. And I know we touched on it last week, but I want to go just a little deeper and give you an illustration that's helped me in the past to understand what he's talking about. So let's look at that word justified. Justified means to be approved. Justified means to meet a certain standard that's been set. Now, in America... If you want to buy some medicine, and it may be the same in Europe, I'm sure it probably is. When you get that bottle of medicine, you will notice that on the medicine there is a stamp, and it says FDA approved on that medicine. And what that means is the Food and Drug Administration has certified that that medicine meets a certain standard. It meets a certain qualification by the government. And that's justification. It's being approved. It's meeting the standard that, was been, that has been set for that particular medicine. And so a good question, I think, for us is, well, what's the standard of God? The FDA has their standards, but what's the standard of God's? Well, God's standard is perfect. God's standard is perfection. Because God is holy and we are not. And his standard of being approved by him is that we have to be perfect. And so the next question is, well, then how do I repair? I know God is holy and I'm not. So how do I repair this this difference between God over here and this gap between us? How do I reconcile my severed relationship before a holy God? And the response from Paul here is I need to attain a righteousness that I don't have. I need to attain a blamelessness that I don't have. An irreproachable status, a righteousness before God that I don't possess. But I need to have it to be before a holy God. Because the Bible says, and Paul writes this in in Romans 2.10, it says, There is no one righteous, not even one. And so Paul comes in verse 16 and he's saying, Man is not justified, not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to look at those two words, faith in Jesus Christ. Because it's faith alone, remember? It's not faith plus something else. It's Christ alone. And so looking at faith, faith, I want us to think of that as the means in which Christ's holiness, Christ's righteousness, Christ's blamelessness comes to me. And it makes me approved before a holy God. Faith is the means of that happening. And then Christ, well, looking at Christ, Christ is the object that makes that happen. Christ is the object himself. He's sufficiently the object that's holy and perfect that makes me justified before a holy God, that makes me approved before a holy God. And so it's not works plus Christ, as some of those Judaizers might have thought. It's not faith plus works, something else. It's it's through faith alone In Christ alone, Paul is saying. And so Paul is saying that the righteousness of Christ was given to us by faith alone. And he's saying the instrument of justification is faith. And then Christ is the object. Christ is the object that sufficiently sufficiently allows me to be justified or proved before a holy God. And I think the best way to think of it maybe is something like this. It's, It's like faith is like the chisel that a sculptor uses to chiseling a statue. Or you could think of it as like faith is like a key. Faith is the key that opens the door that allows us 
to have access to God. It's Christ is the door and faith is the key that opens the door. Now, let me give you an illustration of this. Our family, we love to do escape rooms. So we have three kids, and every year when our kids come home for Christmas, we find an escape room somewhere that we can go. And I don't know if you've ever done those escape rooms, but they're, you know, you go in a room, and there may be multiple rooms, and you go in a room, and they have clues, and you have to work your way through and solve a puzzle or get to the, to the end of the, the, the rooms and get out. That's why they call it an escape room, right? And so we, one, one year we went to Vienna, and we were going to do this really hard escape room because we thought we were pretty good. Boy, did we get humbled. Uh, but So we get in, and they, they put us in this first room, and in this room there must have been 100 keys, literally, that were hanging from the ceiling on these strings. I got 100 keys. And so the person, you know, says, okay, you need to get out of this room just to get to the next room. And there are like five other rooms. And they said, you need to find the one key that will get you out of this room. A hundred keys that were in that room, hanging from the ceiling. And we had to pick out, there was only one key that would work to get us out of that room. And I must say that my daughter did find the key. And we did get out of that room. But I thought about that, and I thought about Paul. And I thought, you know, a hundred keys to choose from. And only one key labeled faith will open that door of Christ and get you out of the room. I mean, you can go ahead and you you can try all kind of other keys, but none of them will work. There's only one key that will work, and it's the key of faith. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying we've been justified through faith in Christ alone. You know, it's not going to be the the key of justifying patience that's going to get you out of that room. Try that one, but it won't get you out. It's not going to be the the key of justifying love that's going to get you out of that room. It's not going to be the key of even repentance or moral behavior. I'm a good person. No, Paul says, no, there's only one key. And it's the key of faith that will get you out of that room. And Christ is the object. Christ is the door through which we go. And can be in fellowship with God. And so let me just be clear on what the, what the definition of faith is. Because if there's one key and that key is faith, I think it's really important that we understand what faith really means. And so faith has these three components to it. It's content information. That's number one. It's an intellectual assent. That's number two. And it's personal trust. Those three things are necessary to be applied to be called faith, content information, intellectual assent, and trust. And so let me give you a simple illustration of, of what that looks like. And let's say that we go out to the Danube River. It's a nice day. After church, we, we go out there. And we see that there's a guy, he's a tightrope walker, and he has strung a rope, a cable from, from Buddha to Pesht. And it's across the river. And he has a wheelbarrow. You know, a wheelbarrow is the one wheeled, like little cart. And, and he has that, and he asks you the question. He says, do you think that I can get from Buddha to Pesht on this wheelbarrow just going across this little thin cable? And you say, yes, I think you can. Well, you know, you've only really accomplished two of those three things. You have content information, and you have intellectual assent. Yes, I think you can. I look, I see it, I think you can. But you really don't have faith until that third thing is applied, the third thing, which is personal trust. And he comes to you and he says, you really think I can do it? Okay, get in the wheelbarrow. Let's go right now. And you go, "Mm -hmm. do I really have faith that he can do it? And the question is, what will you do? What will you do? Will you get in the wheelbarrow or will you not? And Martin Luther talks about faith, and he says, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. I like that definition. Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. So sure, so certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. It means a thousand times he asks you to get in that wheelbarrow. You say yes, because you have faith and know that you can get to the other side. That's how confident faith is in God. And faith links us to Christ. 
That's what Paul's saying. Faith in Christ, Paul says. And so let me summarize this whole kind of first point with this excellent illustration from Harry A. Ironside that I just, I can't stop reading this illustration. And you have to put your thinking cap on it as I say it. But listen to what he says about this idea of faith in Christ and being justified and approved. Listen. It is impossible for an earthly judge to both forgive and justify a man. If a man is justified, he does not need to be forgiven. Imagine a man charged with a crime going to court, Ironside suggested. And after the evidence is all in, he's pronounced not guilty and the judge sets him free. Then someone says as he's leaving the building, I want to congratulate you. It was very kind of the judge to forgive you. Forgive? He did not forgive me. I was justified. There was nothing to forgive. Do you see the image there? And then he goes on to say, and he explains, Ironside, that you cannot justify a man if he does a wicked thing, but you can forgive him. God, however, not only forgives, but he justifies the ungodly because he links the believer with Christ and makes him accepted in the beloved. And that's powerful because we're not just forgiven. We're actually seen by God as righteous, not based on what we've done, but because of Christ and what he's done. And that's why we say justified through faith alone in Christ alone. And so let me finish up this first point with just these these two verses that are hanging here after 16, verses 17 and 18 that say this. And, And Paul uses that word justified again. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean Christ promotes sin? And the response is absolutely not. And then he goes on to say, if I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. And you kind of, I don't know, you look at those and you kind of scratch your head as you're thinking about that. And I'm going to give you kind of the Rich Milhouse translation of what I think is going on there. I think he's really saying, seeking to meet God's standards in Christ, I don't live a perfect life because I'm not a perfect person. I'm a sinner. But that does not mean that Christ is a collaborator with sin. Absolutely not. Don't try and say that. Because we're not perfect people. Our faith in Christ, we are justified. We are declared not guilty. We're declared holy. But that doesn't mean we're perfect people. And then the second one, hey, it says, if I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. And I translate like this. Hey, if I said I don't believe in the law as a means of justification, and I go back and try and use it for justification to be approved by God, then I really would be a hypocrite, wouldn't I? A fake, a charlatan. And that's what Peter was doing, wasn't it? Peter was embracing the gospel, but then he was going back to the law. And going back to the law, he looked like a hypocrite. He looked like a fake. He looked like a charlatan. You see, the gospel is not we give God a good record and then somehow he blesses us. That's not the gospel. The gospel is God through Jesus Christ gives us a perfect record and delights in us. And we live for him out of abundance of gratitude of what we've received from him. It's the freeness that frees us up to really live for Christ. The truth of the gospel, how we've become a Christian. And I want to tell you that that message, when when I was, oh, I think about a senior, senior in high school, when I understood that, when I understood that, you know, I can't reach the standard because God is too holy and great. I mean, there's no way. And I'm just going to get tired, keep trying to be a good person. But it's not what I do. It's what Christ did for me, how he died and and he took my sins on him. When I understood that, I got to tell you, I was like, I was skipping and jumping outside of my front yard the next day. It just was like a weight was lifted off of me. How to become a Christian. It's by faith alone in Christ 
alone and not by the works of the law. So that's the first point that we learn from Paul. But, but he goes on to say that there's more to it than just knowing those things. There's, there's the life that we live. There's dying to live, and then there's dying to live, right? And so Paul talks about that in verses 19 to 21, the transformation of the gospel that takes place in our lives. How do I live the Christian life? And here's what he says, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, this verse 19, if you look at it, it too is is a little puzzling at first when you read it. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. And various Christian commentators say different things. Martin Luther, very interesting what he thought about that. For through the law, I died to the law. He thought that through the law, I died to the law. He thought that first law was really the law of grace. He was saying through the law of grace, in quotations, through the law of grace, I died to that other law, that law that was putting me in bondage, that I might live to God. And then others may see it as, and this is uh, something plausible because Paul does have this kind of attitude later in Galatians. It's through the law. In other words, the law was my tutor and the law led me to know Christ. And you do see that. Paul will say that plainly later in Galatians. You see that avenue. But here's kind of, here's why I'm landing on it today. The law showed me the dead end it was. The law, I, I tried it and it showed me the dead end it was. And so I buried that law life. I just buried it so I could live the God life. That's how I see it. The law showed me the dead end it was, and so I buried the law life so I could live the God life. And really, here's what's important here in this, in this uh, verse. It's this idea, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I died to the law so that I might live for God. And think about Paul saying that. And think about his past and who he was. Paul Paul says that he died to the law so that he might live for God. And that is so strange when you think about Paul's resume. Because he was a Pharisee. He had an impeccable reputation. In fact, in the Old Testament, living by the laws was living for God. And so here Paul is coming along and saying kind of the opposite of that. But Paul is saying that he wasn't living for God when he was trying to obey those laws. And I want to tell you that this is a big surprise for a lot of people. And it's kind of what hit me my senior year in high school. It was a surprise for me that living by the rules, living by the laws is actually a way of living for yourself, not living for God, trying to keep the rules and and trying to do what's right. And if you live for anything else other than God, I'm telling you, you're never going to really be free. Anything else, if, if you live for, you're never going to be free. And so I just want to pause right here and ask the question, who or what are you living for? Who or what are you living for? You know, last week there was just an amazing scientific event that took place. And it was this landing machine, the rover, it's called, that landed on Mars. I don't know if any of you saw that. It was an incredible achievement. There had been men and women working on this project for 10 years. And, you know, they get down to that final point is, is it going to work? And I, I watched it live. It took about 11 seconds, they say, for the transmission of the radio signals to get back from Mars to Earth because of the distance. But they could not test it on Earth because the atmosphere is not the same, right? So they didn't really know until that moment if it was going to work. And and they had this new launch system to to drop it down that had never been done before. And they kind of waited and held their breath, and it it went, and the parachute opened, and it landed. And lo and behold, they got the first pictures from Mars, from this this rover that's going to be there for two years. And... They were so happy. 
They were so elated. They were patting themselves on the back. And you know, that's all good. And that's proper. But if you listen a little closer to what they were saying, uh, if you just kind of tuned in to some of the words and the sentences, it was subtle. But there was elevated ego going on there. There was elevated ego about, look what we can do as man. If we put our minds to it, and we apply the math and the science, I mean, we can put a rover on Mars. And I paused and I thought to myself, but who made Mars, right? Oh, that's really good. And then we come back down to Earth, and my son's in Texas, and he's going through a seven-day winter storm, below zero temperatures, electricity going off, uh, water not working, And I'm thinking, we can't even control the weather. I mean, that's how insignificant we really are, isn't it? And and, and let alone of this planet that we're on, and it's flying through the solar system, and and how all that works. And, and, you know, we're just, we're small. But yet, at times, we have such an elevated view of ourselves. And who are we living for? Well, Galatians says... I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so, when a person trusts Christ, God identifies him or her with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. And not only in the present but also in the future and also in the past. Brian mentioned that. We sung about it. The believer did what Christ did, it's saying. When Christ died, I died. When Christ arose from the grave, I arose to the newness of life. It's like having a post-it note that's put in a book. And everywhere the book goes, the note is in the book. And so the note is identified with the book. My old self-centered life died when I died with Christ on the cross. His spirit-directed life began in me when I rose with Christ in newness of life. And therefore, in this sense, the Christian's life is really the life of Christ. It's a life in Christ. I mean, God sees you as free from guilt of anything you've done wrong, as if you had died on the cross and paid for that yourselves. It's already paid. There's no condemnation because you're in Christ. And although change does come, we're not perfect people, as Paul said, but how do we live the Christian life? How do we live that practically? And I just want to say that everybody is setting their hearts on something. Everybody's setting their hearts on something. Everybody is dying for something. Everybody is thirsty for something. Everybody has longings for something. The approval of people, we long for that. The way family relationships work, the way parental expectations affect you and your life, the world's emphasis on money and power, And sexual beauty, you're thirsting for something. Everybody's thirsting for something. And only if we know these realities, only if we understand these ideas of dying to live for something, only if we really understand what's driving our heart, that can we really act on that and understand that these things that we're living for or these things that we're dying to have, we have to understand those dynamics in the truth of the gospel. And what Paul is saying here, to live for God is to set your heart on something, to set your affections on something. And so let me share with you a story that I heard about 15 years ago from a young pastor who was working his first pastorate in Virginia. And he runs into a middle-aged lady with this most incredible story about living for something in the affections of the heart. And here's what it was. There was this woman, and she had had a hard life. She lived in a trailer park. Um, She didn't have a house. And she had been through many, many relationships, and she didn't look very good because in each of those relationships, 
she had been beaten by those men. But she became a Christian and she started coming to church. And this young pastor, being a young pastor, he he wanted to follow up with her. And so he went to visit her and she shared her story and the things that she was learning. And so he kind of summarized it as he went back and scripted what she had said. And here's what she said to him. She said, you know, I'm going to my counselor and much of what she says is right. I've built my identity and acceptability on men. That's why I've been defenseless with them. I simply needed them too much. All of that is right and helpful, but she went on to say, however, my counselor does not have a very good solution for me. My counselor says that what I should do is get myself a great career, get an education, have a successful career. And although my counselor does mean well, and I absolutely need to get some training and get a career, But what she is saying is, I should do that so I will also feel better about myself. But that would mean I would be switching one kind of idol to another kind of idol. For many years, my heart has been looking at men and saying, unless I'm successful at love, I'm nothing. But the therapist wants me to look at my career and say, unless I'm successful independent businesswoman who's in control of her life, I'm nothing. I don't want to be enslaved to my work as I was to men. I don't want to be as enslaved to my independence as I was to my dependence. I'm actually being asked to exchange a typical male idol for a female idol, and I don't want either, she said. And what made the difference for her, she related, was a similar verse that Paul talks about here, but it's found in Colossians 3, 3, and 4. And it talks about being crucified with Christ. And and she found this verse helpful, and it says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And she said, you see that? My life is in Christ. My life is Christ because I'm hidden in Christ. And that's what Paul is saying here. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I live by faith in the Son of God. I don't live by faith in those other things that I seek to find approval. Not those things. Not my reputation, not other people. No, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And I'm telling you, if you can grasp that, because think about the motivation there. If you were the only person in this entire planet living, Christ would have died for you. He would have gone on the cross for you. And Paul says with, with great affection, who loved me and gave himself up for me. He loved me in spite of all the ugliness and the warts and the things and the ways that I try and seek approval from other people. All the ways that I've hurt God and it says that, no, he loved me. And Paul is just taking us back in the story when he talks like that. I mean, think of Paul's life. Think of what he went through. Paul was, think what Paul was doing in Acts 8. He was killing Christians and he was enhancing his resume as a Pharisee. He was killing Christians and enhancing his resume. And I think he goes, and yet, despite all that, Christ was loving me. And he was dying for me on the cross. And so we ask the question, how can the inner workings of the heart be changed from a dynamic of fear and anger to that of love, joy, and gratitude? And here's how. You need to be moved by the sight of what it cost Christ for your freedom. You need to be moved by what it cost Christ to bring you your freedom. There's an acclaimed foreign film series called Three Seasons. And it's a series of vignettes about life in Vietnam, post-Vietnam War. And one of the stories in there is about high. 
who's a cyclo driver. A cyclo is a bicycle with a rickshaw. And in this story, it's not just about high, but it's about Lan. And Lan is a beautiful prostitute. And both have deep, unfulfilled desires. High's in love with Lan, but she's out of his price range. And Lan lives in grinding poverty and longs to live in the beautiful world of the elegant hotels where she works, but in which she never spends the night. She's, she hopes that the money she makes by prostitution will be her means of escape. But instead, the work brutalizes her, and the work enslaves her. And then High enters a cyclo race and wins the top prize. And with the money, he brings Land to a hotel. He pays for the night and pays her fee. Then to everyone's shock, he tells her, He just wants to watch her fall asleep instead of using the power of his wealth to be intimate with her. He spends it to purchase a place for her for one night in the normal world to fulfill her desire to belong. Elan finds such grace deeply troubling at first, thinking High has done this to control her. And when it becomes apparent that he is using his power to serve rather than to use her, it begins to transform her, making it impossible to return to the life of prostitution. And you see, Jesus Christ, who had all the power in the world, saw us as slaves, slaves by the very things that we thought would free us, but they didn't. And so he He left heaven and he emptied himself out and he came to this earth. He left the glory and he became a servant, Philippians 2 says. And he laid aside the infinities and the immensities of his being and the cost of his life, the Son of God. He paid the debt for our sins, purchasing us the only place our hearts can rest in his Father's house. He purchased that for us, knowing He did this, and it will transform us from the inside out. As High's selfless love did for Lan. And why wouldn't you want to offer yourself to somebody like that? And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And that may be hard to see. That may be hard to grasp. But Paul says in the very last verse of that passage, he says, I do not set aside the grace of God. Oh, no. I'm not going back to that other way of life. Oh, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Dying to really live, Paul is saying. That's the way. And that's the motivation of living the Christian life. And so Paul beautifully shares how to become a Christian and how to be transformed by the power of the gospel as he sums up this first section of Paul's defense of the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the amazing message of your gospel. And Lord, we we confess that we we continue to follow those other paths in our lives and we, we pray that we would set them aside that we look only to you, that our thirst would be in you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.